So I didn't get the exams all the way graded. I got part way through them and then realized I needed to prep lecture instead of finishing grading. And then at you know 9 30 at night, I didn't feel like starting grading anymore. Um, so we'll get there uh, as fast as I can. Um, so we'll just keep going going along where we're gonna just add the reactions for for other um for the carboxylic acid derivatives and they're really pretty straightforward for the most part there's converting it back and forth between the um the acid derivatives uh and there's reduction reactions and that's that's the bulk of the reaction the, where you see most of these things. Um, so other than a few new flavors of reduction and a couple other weird, weird things, um, they're not, it's not too, too tricky in terms of these reactions. Um, and this is where we left off was the conversions back and forth between the different acid derivatives um and really they're the only tricky part about this oops are where do we do the proton transfers and how and these are actually easier i think than the than the class two carbonyls um especially the enamine one that was on the that was on the midterm that is a tricky one because where do I put that pro where do I need to protonate? And it does take some trial and error, even when I was making the key. It took me like, wait, no, not that one. Cross that one out, do it again. Um, to try and avoid making any um strong bases. And so if there's a strong, if it's under basic conditions, it's really straightforward, right? Your nucleophile attacks part of the partial positive on the carbonyl and you make the tetrahedral intermediate, then a leaving group leaves. If it's under acidic conditions, you have to protonate it first because you can have a partial, or you can have a positively charged intermediate, but not a negatively charged intermediate. And so that's just a matter of, okay, after every step, make sure, you know, where you can do, you know, try and do it mentally, check, check ahead of time before you go to the trouble of writing it out. Um, but that takes a lot of practice to be able to do that. And like I said, I can't even do that for some of these reactions. It takes like, no, 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 that's not right. Where could I protonate the step before in order to make this work? Um, so we did this one. So, and part of the, the trick is learning to recognize acidic versus basic conditions. If your nucleophile is already deprotonated, you're probably under basic conditions. If your nucleophile is protonated, then you're under acidic conditions. So, and then in nitrogen nucleophiles in particular, you have to pay attention to that because they have that sweet spot as far as pH goes. Um, so where we want, so if we plot reaction rate versus pH, there's going to be a, a sweet spot where a, there's enough protons to, um, to cause the reaction to happen to allow it for these proton transfer steps. but still have your nitrogen, your amine nucleophiles deprotonated. All right, so you get Miranda. You get much more acidic than you wind up with having enough protons for the proton transfer and making the leaving group 
but you don't, but then you have your, your nucleophile all the way protonated with positive charge, which means it can't act as a nucleophile. And at this point, if you haven't missed anything new, we're just recapping. Awesome. Um, and you do see that with some of these other nucleophiles. So if you get to really acidic conditions, even um, a carboxylic acid has, can't really act as a good nucleophile too, right? Because if you've got most of it protonated, then, then it's not going to be able to, to act as a nucleophile. It gets around it. It's not quite as bad as you mean because you do still have the partial negative on the carbonyl oxygen that can act. So you still do have some lone pairs, even when it's in its protonated state. Um, because if you have an amine, let's just look at ammonia, or rather ammonium. Ammonium is a nucleophile. It isn't a nucleophile. It can't be a nucleophile. There is no lone pair. There's a partial negative technically on the nitrogen, but it's completely surrounded by positives. So nitrogens are where we see this the most. We see it to a lesser extent with some of these other um, potential nucleophiles. And even a, per, a protonated alcohol still has one lone pair that it can go, that it can use. Um, and since nitrogens, we're not going to spend too much time with nitrogens because they really wind up being most important in biochem um, and taking, you know, upper division at uh, OCHEM is where you really start to see nitrogen synthesis. We'll do some of that, but not that much. We typically focus mainly on carbon, oxygen, hydrogen as sort of the, the first year of OCHEM. Um, in terms of making these compounds, if we're if we want to make, so I'm going to go back to this slide. If we can make the acid chloride, making any of the rest of these is really easy. You just expose the acid chloride to the right nucleophile. Acid chloride is being the most reactive with the best leaving group. Getting to any of these others, the trickiest part is usually making sure you don't have more than one nucleophile around making sure if you're trying to get the acid anhydride that you don't have any water present, for instance, because if you have water present, you'll make carboxylic acid instead of the anhydride. So with that in mind, if you want to make the acid chloride, um, we basically play around with Lewis acids and bases to make a better leaving group. Um, and to make the chlorine, a better nucleophile. So just like we did for, for turning the chlorine into, into an electrophile, we played around with Lewis acids in, in the electrophilic aromatic substitution. Um, we're, gonna, we're going to use sulfur to, to interact with the chlorines to make the chlorine a better nucleophile in this case. And simultaneously, we're going to make sure that we are, we're under very acidic conditions to make that OH a better leaving group. So, and one of the ways we do this is, is actually, we actually have the sulfur interact with the oxygen. So we did this also with, um, when we converted an alcohol to a sulfonyl group. Um, and then that made it a better leaving group in order to do an SN2 reaction with it. We first had to have the sulfur, um, sulfonyl chloride interact with the oxygen and that made the oxygen a better leaving group so that a weak nucleophile could come in and replace it. So we'll do the same thing here where you start by having that partial, those electrons attack the sulfur um, so that's actually the, the carboxylic acid acting as a nucleophile. And then you wind up, this is another case of sulfur oxygen bonds are more stable than sulfur chlorine bonds. So oxygen is more electronegative than chlorine even. So we wind up with the chlorine leaving 
which is then going to turn around and act as our nucleophile in a minute. Um, so we don't actually go through a tetrahedral intermediate in this case because we're we're having the oxygen interact with the sulfur. This is the one mechanism that's a little bit different than the other conversions back and forth. So then once you start making, once you have this, that's a really good leaving group. Then you can have the hydrogen, um, remove the hydrogen from it and you make this sort of convoluted looking, I'm not even sure what that, that group as a whole is called. Um, but with all the lone pairs and pi bonds, you wind up with this is a good leaving group, which makes it a good, that carbonyl a good target for chlorine to come in. And now you can go through the tetrahedral intermediate. Right, so this is not an exhaustive list of acid derivatives. That sulfur-based compound that we just made is technically an acid derivative um, that's even more reactive. But starting with something that's really reactive, that sulfur, that thymyl chloride as, as your starting material allows us to get further up here on the reactivity scale and then pretty easily settle back down into the acid chloride. Again, as long as you're making sure there's no water around, no other things to react with. And so part one was you make this, um, use thymyl chloride, make this really good leaving group. It kind of looks almost, I guess it's almost like a, an acid chloride, anhydride, sulfur deal. When you, when you write it out, structure it that way, it looks kind of like an anhydride. Um, And then, but this step, this is just the same exact thing we've already done. Your nucleophile comes in, you make a tetrahedral intermediate right there. And then your leaving group leaves and you reform the carbonyl group. And then it, it doesn't actually stop there. We don't really care about the sulfur at this point, but it ends in sulfur dioxide. Um, because once that sulfur leaves, it just kicks off the chloride and you wind up making SO2 as a gas. So that's one of the things that makes this such a good leaving group is that we wind up with the Chatelier's principle being able to push this over the edge because we're making a gaseous byproduct. So we're doing this in solution, removing the SO2 as it goes. Um, we get, we have a pretty good um, pretty good ability to get a, a high yield here um, from a pretty, while also making a very unstable product. So that makes it a very sort of elegant solution. Other than once you make an acid chloride, the most common reactions that you can that you can see with, with that acid chloride are going to be um, letting it react with the most common nucleophiles. Those nucleophiles wind up um, basically just converting it from the acid chloride to these other acid derivatives. If you want to go back to the acid, all you need to do is expose the acid chloride to water. If you want to turn it into an ester, you just expose it to the anhydrous alcohol in a polar aprotic solvent like pyridine. Um, and these all have their own names too. So hydrolysis, we use that term all the time. There's alcoholysis, which, and these are technically names, but they're not all that common. Um, I'm not even sure if you would say aminolysis or if you would just say preparation of the amine from the acid chloride. Um, hydrolysis is kind of universal enough in a lot of different chemistry and biology fields that that's a, um, a term that shows up all over the place. Um, and 
in the reason to use pyridine and to have these two equivalents of the of the nitrogen um, is because we we are going to produce HCl when we do this, right? When you split that chlorine off, um, it makes an acidic solution. And so if you don't have water around to absorb those extra H pluses, um, you need something else. And so, and you don't necessarily need the pyridine. You could do this if you had, if you just use the alcohol as a, as the solvent as well. Um, you just need to make sure that you have at least two equivalents of it and you're still gonna wind up with, with a solution that's very acidic at the end. And you can't just add water to, to neutralize the acid or add hydroxide to neutralize that acid because that breaks your breaks up the compound that you're making, right? If we wind up making plus HCl here, I said, okay, well, I'm just going to add some sodium hydroxide to neutralize that. Well, that's just, the sodium hydroxide is going to break part of the ester we just worked hard to make. And so you need something that can act as a base that's not going to turn around and disrupt the, the product you just made. Um, and so having a weak base around is, is pretty advantageous in that way. So we know what happens when we put lithium aluminum hydride with a carboxylic acid. What happens if we put it with um, an acid chloride? Turns out the exact same thing. It's a little bit like that, that line from the old, the old X-Men movie, what happens to a toad when it gets struck by lightning? Same thing that, gets, that happens to everything else. It gets reduced, in this case, to the alcohol. Um, really, the only time that we see lithium aluminum hydride not reduce something to the alcohol um, is in the case of amides. We'll, we'll see that you actually just reduce it to the amine instead of to the alcohol in that case. Um, the oxygen is a better leaving group than the nitrogen in that case. Um, and we can use Grignard reagents too. If we have an acid chloride and excess Grignard reagent, um, we can reduce it twice. And the Grignard reagent, if we were trying to do this, if we're going to do both of these steps, we want to do them in the right order. Lithium aluminum hydride, you don't want to use, you probably don't want to use that one first um, because it's, it's so good at reducing things that even if you did one stoichiometric ratio, you might get a variety of products anyway. If you did one stoichiometric ratio of the Grignard reagent and then follow it up with the um, reducing with the hydride source, you probably have a better shot at getting the product that you want. Um, you could do it either way, but you're probably looking at a 60% yield if you want Grignard followed by sodium borohydride versus 40% yield if you went lithium aluminum hydride followed by Grignard. So we're splitting hairs, but it's enough to, to pay attention to. And actually, I, I take it back. They don't, they say you can't do that at all. I forgot about this part. This is actually a direct quote from your textbook. Trying to use only one equivalent of lithium aluminum hydride or Grignard reagent simply leads to a mess of products. That's the technical term, apparently. Um, so if you, if you want to do a partial reduction to make the aldehyde, you can use a lithium trialkoxy aluminum hydride that only has one hydrogen that can act as a hydride. Or you can use a Gilman reagent to partially reduce Um, and so a Gilman reagent is basically a, a more specialized, less reactive version of a Grignard reagent. So it uses copper instead of magnesium 
Um, it's a little bit harder to make, but it winds up being a better or a more selective. It's not better because it's not as strong um, of a reducing agent. So it's not going to give you as good a yield, but it, it can give you more predictable yields. Then that can be more um, an advantage in this case. And when something does simply lead to a mess of products, it doesn't mean that you can't use it, but it's sort of a, it's not gonna be your most economical way, generally speaking. It's a brute force approach. When absolutely nothing else works, use the method that gives you a mess of products and hope that the product you care about is one of them is, you know, in double digits in terms of yield. And the other thing about these, other versions is they're less reactive, but what we care more about is that less reactive means more selective, right? It's two sides of the same coin. It's your, your friend who only drinks high-end whiskey going out to a dive bar versus your friend who drinks everything. One leads to a mess and one doesn't necessarily. All right, so let's do some practice with these. So excess of the aluminum hydride means you're going to do, you're going to reduce it twice. Excess green yard reagent. Then here is your more selective version. Please, and it's, it's that time of the year. It's when the weather starts getting nice outside, things warm up. It's really hard. I used to be able to like go about my day and be fine, but I struggle this morning. Okay. You boys are free? Free. And like I said, I, I think I, I read a study. It's the first five years of the kid's life, parents are, are clinically sleep deprived. So you're still, still in the thick of that. Yeah, they're usually such good sleepers. I think it's just because the house is kind of hot and the bed we were sleeping at my parents' house during the week. And it's just and they're still wearing their like winter jammies because they're attached to them. So yeah, that's they, they were just getting sweaty. That's but, that struggle is real. Yeah, it, everything stinks in my son's room because he wants to wear his warm pajamas. Yes, for a bit. Yes. You're so sweaty. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry for my tangent. Uh, no problem. I couldn't turn it down. By the way, it's like already on the boat. Yeah, if that, we can open some windows though. Okay. I would, oh, yeah. I would, I got it. Though. So, bring me when. You should have seen the look on the lab consultant's face when I told them that our, our method for getting greater airflow, we needed to, to clear out the high ceilings um, from, from 
fumes was to turn on the fume hoods on one side and open the windows on the other. He was aghast. I was, you do what? So I don't think our new lab's going to have the ability to open windows. It spoiled that by telling you that I that I do that. Fine, I'm not going to give you windows you can open then. I just don't understand why that would be a problem. It's just in in analytical labs and and working labs, drawing in unknowns and pollen and stuff like that can contaminate samples. For an instructional lab, I don't see the big deal. Yeah, but I'm not the, I'm not the um, high end consultant, so we'll go with their their selection. I mean, I guess you know since you said that they're gonna they're they're gonna be forced to put in like an actually good ventilation system to go great. Yeah. So you don't want us to do some janky stuff or uh, <laughs> give us the right tools. <laughs> All right. So the reducing agents, nothing that we haven't seen before. I guess technically we haven't seen it with the acid chloride before, but just a reminder that since the chloride is the better leaving group, we just go to the alcohol. So if it's an excess hydride. We just wind up there. And if you wanted to, you could show the two new hydrides attached there. Nobody's going to ding you for not being proper skeletal structure because you're showing the new bonds that are, are being formed. And it's the same exact structure that we get with the phenyl magnesium bromide, except instead of hydrides, we're adding phenyl groups. And since we we have some experience with adding, with making phenyl magnesium bromide. We know that despite how large of a group it is, it is pretty easy to make that into a Grignard reagent and get decent yields. I consider decent yields an exaggeration. I guess we did, yes, it was single digit yields, right? But that was that was after we waited for a whole week and let it let it uh, age. Um, we can, right. Yeah. Right. So this is what the trickier ones are when you have. I guess they're not trickier. It just means you need to pay more attention. That trialkoxy hydride means that you can you will just reduce it once and whatever the better leaving group is leaves in this case you wind up chopping off the chloride replacing it with the hydride so we'll after step one we make the aldehyde and then we expose it to a green yard reagent which is going to take it and turn it into the um, secondary alcohol. So we wind up with there's an ethyl group we just added and an OH. So if we want to take a carboxylic acid derivative and turn it to a secondary alcohol. Primary alcohol is easy. You just do excess lithium aluminum hydride. Tertiary alcohol is easy. It goes into excess green yard reagent. If you want to make a secondary alcohol, you have to use the more selective reagents. And do them in the right order, right? You don't want to start with the green yard reagent and then follow it up with the hydride. If you're going to start with the green yard or with the um, adding the alkyl group, you need to use that Gilman reagent. Which is the copper lithium one. So, so in, in that last one, does the water do anything after the green yard? Or it's it's just your proton source okay. because technically, after step two, we have a deprotonated alcohol. Okay. And then the water, and then the water comes in just to be the proton source to okay. turn it into the alcohol. 
So this is actually one of those cases where there are two equally valid um, synthesis processes to get to the same product. <coughs> if you start with the ethyl lithium copper compound, it's a um, it's ethyl ethyl lithium cuprate is the is the name, but you can just call it the ethyl gilded reagent. Whatever is attached to the copper is your nucleophile. The same way that whatever is attached to the magnesium is your nucleophile for um, a Grignard reagent. Um, and it works the exact same way, right? Copper or the carbon is more electronegative than any of the metals. So when you have a carbon directly attached to a metal, you have a carbon that can act as a nucleophile. But the difference in the electronegativity is not as stark, which means you, you do have, it's not as reactive. In fact, these are actually stable enough that I think you can buy these as a solid um, and store them on the, on the shelf. Um, you're not gonna get as great yields as using a Grignard reagent, because the Grignard reagent is more reactive. All right, so in this case, you end up with an ethyl group as our nucleophile. Despite having two ethyls attached, I don't think that you can, if you don't get a stoichiometric amount out of it. Um, so I don't think you could use this use one mole of the lithium cuprate for two moles of the carbonyl compounds? I don't think. I would, I'm going to double check that though. So after step one, we take the, the acid chloride, add the ethyl group to it and turn it to a ketone. And then step two, and you could use sodium borohydride at this point too. We don't need the lithium aluminum hydride once we turn it into a class, class two carbonyl. But the net result is we get the same exact compound as as we did on C on the last page. So this also does give us a lot of flexibility too, just in terms of, okay, well, what do we have in the stock room? Do we have the dry alkoxy um, hydride source or do we have, um, you know, if you don't have the lithium aluminum hydride, Using Gilman reagents is a good way to get around that. So you use your Gilman reagent first, and then you can use sodium borohydride, which lasts better on the shelf. And so it just gives us a little flexibility if we were trying to workshop this for a industrial chemistry and we really cared about the efficiency, we would try both processes at the lab scale and see which one gives us a better yield. And then we would factor into the, the um, equation the um, shelf life of the components and what cost they are. It's possible that that the Gilman reagents are cheaper to make because copper and lithium are cheap, but magnesium is not as cheap. So there's also those considerations as well when we're trying to decide what the best option is. So in step two, if we would have had excess lithium aluminum hydride, would we have taken off the ethyl group? So it would have just been like for for this one? Yeah. No, because lithium, even lithium aluminum hydride can't knock off an entire um, alkyl group. Okay. So either of them. Okay. Either lithium aluminum hydride or sodium borohydride would work. And the excess aspect doesn't matter in this case. In fact, we probably want an excess, uh, at least a slight excess, just to drive that equilibrium further towards the product. Um, but it's not going to happen twice. So lithium aluminum hydride can just knock off like the, the allies they can't. Exactly, that are already a good leaving group. Okay. All right, so for E, we have a nucleophile 
the form of an alcohol, and we've got a good leaving group here. So once we make the acid chloride, this is just going to go through our tetrahedral intermediate. And the fact that we have pyridine, and we're making HCl as a product, tells us that we're under basic conditions, which means if we're drawing a mechanism, this is the easy version of the mechanism too, um, because we just wind up with our, um, we probably start by deprotonating the phenol to make the phenolate as a nucleophile and make a intermediate that looks like That looks like this. And then you can wind up with fluoride leaving, right, taking its electrons with it. That negative charge comes down to reform the carbonyl. So our final product winds up being phenylbenzoate. Seems weird to use two different bases for the name. Um, we've got the benzoate for one of the benzene rings and then phenyl as a branch for the other one, but that's one of them is a branch and one of them is not. So phenylbenzoate is the right name, which off the top of my head, I can't think of what purpose phenyl benzoate might have, but I guarantee you that there's some purpose either industrially or in biochemistry for phenyl benzoate. No, it shows up on uh, Victor. Okay. Yeah. Was that one of the nomenclature ones? Uh, or just nomenclature, but it showed up like two or three times. Maybe it just felt like that because you had to draw it 16 times <laughs> with all your proton transfer steps. Yeah. I just don't remember like thinking like this is the little bit of the way All right, so for the for F, we wind up with similar steps. And so we wind up with the making the amide instead of the ester. So it being a secondary amine means that you wind up making a secondary amide. It still has two carbons attached to the nitrogen. You can't really do this with a tertiary amine because you don't have a good leaving group. And so you, if you try to make a tertiary, a tertiary amide from a tertiary amine, it's not really going to work because you're going to wind up with with a it's really it would be a quaternary amide, um, which are not going to be very stable. You could probably it's probably stable enough that you could make an ionic compound out of it, but it's not going to give you great yields because you're making something that's inherently um, inherently hard to or inherently uphill in energy. And right, so anytime you've got amine present, you're just going to replace a good leaving group. Amines are the worst, nitrogens are the worst leaving group. They're the strongest bases, so they, they're the least stable on their own. Um, so and that's, so that's going to be a common theme for all of these different acid derivatives. If, if you expose them to an amine, the amine turns it into an amide, replaces that other leaving group. And so, um, let's look at acid anhydrides briefly, since it's going to be, it's very, very similar to acid chlorides. It's 
also got a really good leaving group. Um, preparing them is its, is its own thing though, because we can't use that thionyl chloride approach because we're not trying to add a chloride to it. But if you can make the acid chloride, making the acid anhydride is really easy. You just wind up with using that, the deprotonated acid as your nucleophile and replacing chloride. So chloride being an even better leaving group means the second step is really straightforward. If you want to make the ac acetic anhydride, you can do it just by brute force. If you take acetic acid and you put it to 800 Celsius, um, you can dehydrate it and just pull the water molecule off and make the acetic anhydride. So acetic anhydride is, is really cheap as far as anhydrides go because heat is cheap, relatively speaking, and vinegar is cheap. And that's really all you need. You can, in theory, if you just took white vinegar, dumped it into a, into a reactor and heated it up to 800 Celsius and held it there till it stopped evaporating water off, you made acetic anhydride. Um, if you want to make a more specific anhydride, you kind of have to go through the acid chloride route. Make, make the acid chloride for one side, get the deprotonated acid form of the other side, and then let them react together. And you don't have to have the same R group in this case. So it allows us very easily to show how this works. And this is one case where isotopic studies were really, I guess this one's fairly straightforward because there's no other oxygen. So it's pretty easy to, to say where the, the middle oxygen came from. Um, but when it comes to having these things split up, these acid anhydrides getting split into two pieces, um, they've used isotopic studies to say, okay, if we take this middle oxygen and make it an oxygen 18 instead of an oxygen 16, and then track which of the two, which of the products gets the oxygen 18, you wind up, it turns out, with pretty even amounts of both of them, unless there is some extra resonance. If one of these R groups has resonance, with the acid group, then that's going to get you extra stabilization for bringing the oxygen with that group. And so resonance can affect which products you make to some extent, but you're still going to wind up with a mixture of both of them in all likelihoods. All right. And let's take a break there. Let's come back at nine o'clock and then we'll tackle this mess of a figure. The book bookstore open at night? Yeah. Well then, should we keep going for five minutes so <laughs> people can get coffee? That would be good. All right, let's go for another five. Let's look at this figure. We'll go for five minutes and then we'll take a break. All right, so now that we have all of these different functional groups and all of these different ways of, of um, reducing them and producing them and switching back and forth between them, we get these really big convoluted looking um, reaction summaries. For the most part, they're not all that different than what we've already seen, though. This is just trying to put a whole lot of information in a small amount of space, right? It's like your cheat sheets. Your cheat sheets look convoluted, too, um, until you dissect. And they are convoluted. But when you dissect them, you can see what the different pieces are. So 
let's see. All of those are just converting the acid anhydride into the various other forms of, of acid derivatives and actually these ones over here too. And yeah, this this whole section. It's just the particulars of converting from one acid derivative to others. So if you want to make the primary amide, you expose it to excess ammonia. If you want to make the secondary a secondary amide, you go this route. If you want to make the ester, you use an alcohol. If you want to turn the acid and hydride back to the acid, you just expose it to water. If you want to take the acid and turn it into the acid and hydride, you just deprotonate the acid and you expose it to the acid chloride. And for some of them, basically just for acetic acid, you can just take the acid and heat it to make the acetic anhydride. From the acid derivatives, you can't really oxidize them any further. This, these carbons, the carbonyl carbons, already have an oxidation state of plus three. The only way you could get them more oxidized is if you took them all the way to CO2. So with that in mind, there really aren't any other oxidation reactions. So we have substitution reactions that allow us to go back and forth between all the different acid derivatives. And then we have reduction reactions and that's effectively it. All the ones I circled in red are all just different different flavors of reduction reactions. You've got the brute force reduction reactions where you just use excess and have the same reaction happen twice. And then you've got the more selective reduction reactions where you Stop the reaction after one step. And then you could continue the reduction with the other step if you so chose. Right, so, and this is going to be true for all these different acid derivatives is there's a bunch of reactions that allow you to convert back and forth between them. There's a bunch of reactions that allow you to reduce them selectively, but other than that, they're all the same, the same reaction classes. Um, where the different acid derivatives are different from each other is predominantly just in stability and in application because esters have different applications than amides, which have different applications than the carboxylic acids. So drug design, biochemistry, um, lots of those applications, we care about which acid derivative we have. Um, but in terms of OCHEM, they're almost all interchangeable. It's a pretty, it's just a matter of figuring out the particulars of what conditions you need to switch back and forth between them. There is I believe there's a formic acid chloride 
think that COCl2 is a real molecule. Yeah, it's oxygen. Yes. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> third guess. Um, so, that one is about as reactive and pleasant as you would expect. Um, I don't know. The form the formal groups are weird because they they don't even behave like they would expect for formaldehyde, right? Because formaldehyde really exists as a methane diol um, for all intents and purposes. So my guess is no. I don't see any reason. I mean, there's not technically a reason why you couldn't, other than just stability. It's just too reactive. For it to to do that, it might find, it might wind up actually forming some sort of weird five sided ring instead. Because in theory, yes, you can do. This, but you've already got five atoms in a ring structure, and, and so you might just wind up with something weird happening where you wind up making. Some sort of peroxide, like an ozonide. It would look like an ozonide at that point, right? You want a peroxide bond between the two oxygens. Which I can see it, you know, dehydrating. To I think it's it's just going to wind up forming carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. You're going to get a and probably an equal mixture of both of them, because that's what happens if you try to do ozonolysis with a alkene. That's at the end. You just get CO two. So I think that you, will, I think you would get something similar in this case. Um, it would wind up just decomposing into smaller um, gas molecules. Good question, though. All right, these last two. Here are. The same thing that we have already talked about. This is just specifically, um, it's referred to as an acylation of alcohols and amines. If you start with an alcohol, it's it really that's just switching up your point of view. You could also think of it as being the esterification of the acid anhydride um, or the acylation of the alcohol. It's really just depends on what your frame of reference is. Um, but adding an acyl group, um, or especially if they call it the acetylation, then you're adding an acetyl group. Um, and that's what you do with salicylic acid to make acetyl salicylic acid or aspirin. Salicylic acid is benzoic acid with an OH. There's benzoic acid, you put an OH in the ortho position, that's salicylic acid. If you expose that to acetic anhydride, you turn that alcohol into an ester. And you get the aspirin as your byproduct. And there's a reason this is pretty much always the first organic reaction that people do. One, because you get to make a biologically active molecule. Everybody knows what aspirin is, and so that's pretty cool. Um, and two, it, it, acetic anhydride and salicylic acid are both really cheap. So you can do it at scale without really having, without it being um, cost prohibitive. Um, and the yields are really, really good. And you make something that's not soluble easily in water and crystallizes out nicely that you can then take a melting point of. So this is one of the first synthesis. I think you probably did this. Uh, you, you would have done this if you hadn't run into doing, doing um, gen chem during COVID. Um, it's like one of the last reactions you do because you get one chapter or so of organic chemistry at the end. So it's, Dump some acetic anhydride and some salicylic acid together. Look at the fun crystals that you get. Um, that's aspirin. Don't you want to take OCHEM now? Um, 
So it's it's a really common reaction to to do. And actually, it's still a fairly interesting reaction to us at this level because you can play around with conditions, play around with pH, or you know, dehydrate going through some some sort of um, purification step ahead of time to try and make it anhydrous or something like that. See if you can increase yields or purify your product that way. Um, so it's still a fun reaction and it's fast and it gets good yields reliably. All right, there we go. We'll come back at 10 after now. Give everybody a chance to re-up on their caffeine. Go for a little walk, enjoy the sunlight. So I, uh, yesterday I spent four hours grinding metal on the sides. I thought you were going to be doing that on Friday. Uh, on Friday yeah, too. I was planning to, yeah. Um, and then we, you know, we have dance sessions on mm -hmm. Friday. We have to go for anything at once. Don't do that one for the day. That's normal. You wouldn't believe the amount of laundry that's spread all over my house right now. But I kind of want to show you something. So, this is the, the, so the the ceramics lab is now at the or the ceramics uh, office mm -hmm. and the glaze room. It's it's like the uh, the green room for okay. theater, and then like the uh, glaze room is the bathroom in the green room. In fact, the toilet has like a thing over the top of it, and it's now like a big shelf, and there's like a machine that blends stuff that's like in the bathroom. And nice. The stall. Anyway, so. <laughs> Uh, these are okay. like the tests, you know, kind of how I arranged them. And then uh, this one, Cypress. Did you make that tray? Uh, Grace made the tray. Nice. Uh, she had a bunch of them for doing place tests. Mm -hmm. And so this is uh, yttrium bismuth manganese mm -hmm. from lowest concentration to highest concentration of manganese. And then this one is yttrium indium bismuth. From lowest to highest concentration of bismuth. In fact, these uh, are just atrium bismuth. See if that does. Did you do your casing with the blue? I did. Do you have a picture of that? I don't have a picture of it. It's still dry. <laughs> okay. So I made oil painting and it's like taking forever. That's exciting. And then this uh, red stuff is uh, atrium indium iron. And these are the last and that's the, yeah. I used the face with the last of the indium oxide to make more of the of different pieces. And that are those after being fired or so this is uh in the kiln presently. Uh, okay. last night at like eight o'clock. It's a 24 hour fire schedule. Cool. So like Wednesday sort of close to the end of the day, I'll we'll like open it up and see what happens. Takes that long to to cool them then too. They're in the kiln ready yeah. to fire. Or so, oh, it's Tuesday today. It's not so, Monday. So yeah, it was yesterday at nine o'clock. It started the sequence and then it went up to temperature. Uh, it was like 250 Fahrenheit per hour or something. So so pretty much it's up to temperature now, mm -hmm. or maybe at around you know, three or four in the morning, got up to temperature. Uh, which is 1200 Celsius, and it's holding that for 24 hours. So, about four in the morning tomorrow, it'll be starting to cool and then going from 1200 Celsius to you can open it without ruining the whole fire brick inside. Right. Uh, that, um, I've seen a lot of so Yeah. Opening, hoping to see it before we take off tomorrow, or at least we see it. Hoping yeah. to see it before we take off. Yeah. Yeah, are you? Are you going down to the bay tomorrow or? Oh, uh, sorry, you said take off to speak today. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. I got it. 
it. Yeah, I'm <laughs> those those AeroPress ones. I prefer even the pour over, just because you get the good mixing and then you get the high pressure, so you get it's you actually wind up making an espresso out of it. Um, and you don't. The problem with pour over coffee, from a chemistry point of view, is that's not the right way to do a filtration. You need it well stirred so that you don't develop channels through it that don't get all the way. too much i take it off i run some cold water over the hill let it sit for a minute and get it down it's right around 80 celsius i found yeah, I, I can tell by the way the kettle sounds mm -hmm. so, that's in the brain. so if i can't have good coffee then I, my solution is go as far away from coffee as possible yeah that's, that makes sense I don't mind tea, not when I want caffeine though. Mate, a, mate I like mate. You know, you've got the, it's like the strongest tea. Really. Well, and it's it's really its own thing too because it has other stimulants in it too. Um, it? I looked into that because I heard somebody say, that, "Oh yeah, I like mate, I like analog caffeine." No, it needs to be a bromine. Oh, okay. I, well, I guess technically that is that's, I mean, that's, that's like that's a chocolate, but right? That's, yeah. But in, in smaller amounts, and it will present in larger amounts. And I don't think it's an analog, so I, I think it works on a different pathway. I mean, it's at least a chemical analog, yes, it's a stimulant. It's like uh, theobromine is like one methyl group away from being happy, synthesizing happy. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see what Google has to say. Oh, Mate, okay. I, uh, 
Well, and the, the fact that the first thing is not a, a chemical. So it's, oh, it's matine is a combination of caffeine, theobromine, and theophylline. Theophylline. So those are all uh, theophylline, probably. But that's a, that's definitely a yeah. caffeine analog. Yeah, those are all like involved. Right. So. Um, so maybe it's just the different the different ratio that it's present in. But I definitely know that that if I have mate, I get I get the shakes and can't sleep as well at night beyond what just caffeine or coffee does for me. So it's just maybe it's just you know not being as used to those compounds or in that ratio. Maybe it's that, that I'm having that in the early afternoon after I've already had a fair bit of coffee and just get jittery. That's, uh, that's also entirely possible. All right. Oh no, you had to settle for the monster too. Yeah, I could get it to work. Oh, that was so crazy. Like after my pregnancy, I, I used to drink sugar-free Red Bull all the time. And then after I tried, I would get the worst headache. So I hope the, the white tiger treats me nicer than uh, sugar-free Red Bull. So that's the, the sh I can't drink any of the sugary ones. They yeah. give me the headache and my, my guts are not pleased with me. Yeah. If I drink my so regular I sugar one, so. These used to be like my favorite monsters, so maybe they'll treat me better. Old time sick. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> All right. So the you probably have figured out the theme of this lecture is we're just going to cruise through all the acid derivatives um, and do the sort of the same thing we already did with acid chlorides and acid anhydrides. So next up is esters. Um, esters are similar enough in terms of reactivity to acids that they do show up in a lot of physiological applications um, and a lot of, you know, they're pretty stable. There are food additives a lot of times um, and in weird ways too. Like, so the, the um, banana flavoring, we talked about banana flavoring, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, that's an ester. It's not actually found in bananas, but it's close enough. It triggers some of the same taste receptors. Um, but so they do have their own what comes along with having actual real world applications is you wind up with actual real world um, common names like saponification. Esterification is when you make an ester, saponification is when you break an ester up. And it literally comes from the Latin word for soap. Um, sapon is the Latin word for soap because this was actually the process in, in Fight Club. They take the triglycerides, they treat them with nitric acid, and they wind up with um, with glycerin and um, soap, effectively. So that's why it's called saponification. It's literally the soap making process is to take esters and break them into, into fatty acids. Um, so the way to make esters the easiest way is you just, if you have a, right, it's not the easiest way necessarily, but the, um, the way we've already seen is if you deprotonate an acid, then you have a decent nucleophile. Then if you have something with a good leaving group, you can just use that as your nucleophile. Um, and so that's just a substitution, just SN1 or SN2 as the conditions allow. Um, more commonly is basically just allow the, as the esterification you get, if you just take the acid and an alcohol and allow them to react together, they go through a dehydration reaction. Um, and so this one, you can, it's an equilibrium reaction that happens in both directions. So if you have some way of removing the water molecule that you're making, you can use equilibrium to drive that. 
Otherwise, you just wind up with a sort of an equal mixture of the of the components um, to some extent, um, which then you could separate out and try to remove as much of that as possible. And then the best yield, though, is going to be from acid chlorides. Because if you start, from, if you make the acid chloride, all it takes is exposing it, and this is the reaction we already talked about today. You take the alcohol in the, in the base um, that's not going to compete with the process. So purity is, is the base of choice in this case. Um, and you wind up replacing that chloride group with your alcohol. Right, so three reactions we've already seen before. Um, here are the reactions that we haven't once we make the ester, we can cause this Fischer esterification. We can have this, this process go backwards. We start from the ester, sorry. We can expose the ester to sodium hydroxide and then just reprotonate everything at the end. That's effectively, we use pH to sort of control the equilibrium here as well. Under acidic conditions, you favor making the ester product. Under basic conditions, you favor taking the, the ester and turning it back to being the acid and the alcohol. So the saponification and the esterification are just opposites, opposite directions for the same reaction, really. And if sapon meaning soap is not enough to remember it, um, Spanish word for soap is jabón, right? So take the Latin word and in Espanifaya, Espanifaya, and you get jabón, sapon, similar enough. Um, I always thought that was really fascinating because I, I, you know, watching Fight Club in high school, it was like the closest thing I'd ever had to anthropology in terms of like the, the hero worship part where he's talking about washing clothes downstream a certain, because that's actually accurate. Um, and that was like my first exposure to like physical anthropology and chemistry behind some of these anthrop anthropological processes and studies. Um, so as strange as it sounds, Fight Club was a good gateway drug for chemistry for me personally. Um, and actually making the nitroglycerin, it's not all that far off. You take glycerin and you expose it to concentrated nitric acid. You can make nitroglycerin that way. Um, just not great yields and you have to know where to get concentrated nitric acid, which is why they can just throw it in a Hollywood movie. Um, so yeah, that was pretty cool about that. But, uh, there's all this, uh, there's always like little clues throughout like a lot of the scenes where they're like giving that announcement when they're making and stuff, you know, all the stuff like just having sodium hydroxide around, you know, it's like a case of so and uh, extracting the glycerin from that, you know, and then they, they mentioned nitric acid and they mentioned ether, and so those are things that you need to do with hydration reactions and stuff. Like yeah. Water. The, the little the little things there and it's breaking back is the same way too right they didn't show the entire process they didn't want to they, they wanted to walk that line between making the science after it and avoiding copycats they didn't want to just straight up have incorrect science <laughs> but at the same time they didn't want to give people an instruction uh, manual for making that um, and so walking that line of like, we're just going to leave out some of these and make sure that we never show several of these important steps. Um, also, they hilariously made it where it's like easy to get phenol state of acid, but hard to get methyl, which is like not how it is. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, they, they took some liberties that way. But anyway. Um, yeah, Chuck Palahniuk in general, I really, I really like his writing too. The guy who wrote Pipe Club. Um, yeah. 
unfortunately, people think that Fight Club is like a, like an instruction manual in itself. But you know, eighteen-year-old males are going to do that. So anyway, um, the other trick with esters is that if you get too acidic, you have acid catalyzed hydrolysis as well. So under basic conditions, an ester can be turned back into the acid and the base and the um, alcohol. Under acidic conditions, an ester can be turned back into the acid and the alcohol. So really esters in the presence of water don't last very long. If you have water around, you have an equilibrium happening where you've got some mixture of the two, which is why esters like aspirin have a, an expiration date. They have a shelf life um, and why they, you know, you should seal the bottle all the way when you close medication because there's almost always something that water is going to ruin. Um, and a lot of times it's breaking down either an ester or an amide. To some extent, but esters in particular are very susceptible to that. Um, up here at altitude, we have a longer shelf life than what's actually on the bottle, but still, they'll go bad eventually. Um, and then the other reaction that esters go through is if you expose them to nitrogen, you get the amide. So, again, same reaction we've seen, we're just putting it into a more formalized context here. Um, this piece at the bottom, you can do a reduction and partial reduction of esters, just like acid chlorides, except that you don't use trialkyl, trialkoxy aluminum hydride. You use diisobutyl aluminum hydride, which is frequently abbreviated Dibol, actually more commonly dibol. Um, so it's D I B A lowercase L H. Dibol is diisobutyl aluminum hydride. It works the same way as trialkoxy aluminum hydride. It just with esters, the trialkoxy aluminum hydride is not quite reactive enough. And with acid chlorides, the dibol is too reactive. So acid chlorides being more reactive than esters in general means we have to fine tune that reactivity if we want it to be selective. Um, and so this is one of those one of those cases where if you lived in this world, you would just have your oh like I know okay for my particular application we use dibol, for this application we would use something else. And if you ever switched applications or needed to tweak your procedure, you could go out and look what are the other selected hydride sources um, to determine what this works. But Gilman, I believe the Gilman reagents still work. The, the lithium cuprates um, still work for the, for esters, for everything except for amides, I believe. So you could just use that, go in the right order, do your Gilman reagent first, and then use sodium borohydride or lithium aluminum hydride to do the second step if need be. So let's do some review. Let's try and see if we can cement this in our brains well enough that we can remember it. So I'll leave this up there for a few minutes. Give you a chance to work through it. <clears throat> 
So occasionally it can be helpful when you're switching back and forth between these to circle what your leaving group is and what's replacing it so you can see what's what. In this case with the symmetrical molecule, it's not too hard, but still make sure you, you have to circle one of those oxygens to be leaving with it. So you're going to make the benzoate with one part that's not changing, again, somewhat arbitrarily. Um, I'm thinking which piece is quote unquote not changing. We go from the, the benzoic anhydride to the phenyl benzoate again. And then our other product in this case is going to be another benzoic acid molecule. This one's written backwards relative to the one above it. But again, you got the anhydride that's going to get, that's going to react. You're going to replace one of those acid groups with this whole big thing. So it is sort of arbitrary distinction, which one is considered the reactant and which one is the, the reagent. Um, but it really doesn't matter. They really most correctly should just be written with a plus symbol either way. But typically, whatever the smaller one is, the one that gets written as of being above that reaction arrow. But all we're doing is we know if we're turning an alcohol and an anhydride are going to turn into an ester. So then it's just a matter of. Keeping everything the same as much as possible. And we're adding an acetyl group, sometimes pronounced an acetyl group, depending on who you're talking to. And you get acetic acid as your byproduct. So just like we've seen for a long time, recognize your functional groups, put the functional groups together in the right way and just keep the rest of the molecule the same. Draw it in whichever way is convenient for you. Usually, for me at least, keeping the larger part of the molecule in the same orientation, taking the smaller molecule that's being added to it um, and tweaking that helps me keep everything straight. But it's just a matter of getting used to that process and recognizing, oh, an alcohol plus another acid derivative, that's going to make an ester. How do I draw that ester properly? And which side gets the carbonyl group? Right. And so whatever part starts as the acid derivative still has the carbonyl piece to it, right? The acid and hydride was the acid derivative to begin with. So that's the side that keeps the carbon over. If we have an amine and an acid hydride, acid anhydride, I'm sorry, we're taking that acid anhydride and reacting it with the nitrogen. So we're going to get the other piece of the acid anhydride again, 
plus the propanoic acid as our byproduct. D is written backwards, but again, it's the same thing. Right? Here's our acid derivative. Here's our new piece. plus acetic acid. Right, so the bottom piece is, let me clear some space here. So for A, excess lithium aluminum hydride, we can't kick off an oxygen on its own. So we're still going to wind up with the alcohol. And we're starting from the acid derivative with excess lithium aluminum hydride. That means we're going to wind up with the um, primary alcohol. So for A, And then the, the alcohol piece, the, the methanol, just or the um, methoxy group, just turns into a methanol. Excess ethyl magnesium bromide for B. Again, same molecule. You just wind up adding two ethyl groups to it again, plus methanol. C is a little tricky because it's ring opening. And we have to identify which of the carbons is getting reduced. Remember, it's, that's the carbon that's getting reduced. So you breaking that bond, but you're not knocking that alcohol off. So if you count your, your carbons properly, one, one, two, three, four, five carbons, you're gonna wind up with an alcohol at each end. So one, two, three, four, five, OH, OH, so one five pentane dial. You take an ester and you expose it to an acid. You just take the acid, the pieces of the ester, turn that into an alcohol, and you turn this back into the carboxylic acid. So you're going to get cyclohexane carboxylic acid and ethanol. If you deprotonate an alcohol, then you turn the piece that's left into a nucleophile. And then, so then exposing it to ethyl iodide with a good leaving group means you just get it displacing the iodide and forming the ester. 
So you wind up with ethyl benzoate in this case. And then last but not least for F, we have another ring opening reaction. There's the carbon that's getting reduced. So we're putting two new ethyls on that carbon and breaking this bond. So we can start by putting those pieces back where they were. Then we had one carbon. It's still going to have an OH attached to it. And then an F2 different ethyls being attached to it. So one, two, one, two. Something looks like that. So Something also be very painful to name the value pack rules. Because right? we have not, it is a diol, but it's a diol where the two oxygens are on very different branch structures. This is what we're just using the hydroxy. We'd want to use hydroxy. We'd probably do that, probably name it as, as a benzene. Because then we have two complicated branches, but they're complicated both coming off of the benzene. If we named this is our parent molecule, we have a phenyl group that has an ethyl group that has a hydroxy group. So we need to use nested parentheses then, which we try to avoid. It's doable, but if we can pick a different functional group as our as a base molecule to avoid that, that's usually better. Nothing wrong with this. <laughs> okay, I mean, I'm I'm down. Let's look at the two different possibilities. There is there is some value in seeing how nested parentheses work. So let's clear. Everything except for that. Give ourselves some space. We'll zoom in on it too. All right, so the first way of looking at this, so if we consider that to be our parent molecule, then we say, okay, well, it's going to be benzene, something benzene. This is an ethyl group that has a hydroxy on it. So we can say, call that carbon one on the benzene ring, we can say two hydroxyethyl. So that names that bottom branch. The top branch is gonna be on carbon two of the benzene ring. And it's going to be a propyl that has two things attached to it. So one hydroxy one ethyl propyl. So one open parentheses, two hydroxy ethyl, close parentheses, two open parentheses, one hydroxy, one ethyl propyl, close parentheses, benzene. If we try to go the other way and call this our parent molecule, then all of this is one branch that has, so you've got a branch that has a complicated branch within it. 
So our base molecule then would be, actually it would be, yeah, so it'd be a pent, it'd be pentanol. So three, And our complicated branch is going to get its whole, whole line here. On carbon three, you've got a something phenyl. And on that phenyl group, on carbon two of that phenyl group, there's a two hydroxy ethyl so three two two hydroxy ethyl phenyl three pentanol so doing the um it's, it is actually shorter, but we typically try to avoid having the nested parentheses. They work the same way, but that takes a lot more paying attention to, and it's even harder to say it. Um, so we try to have as few layers of complexity as possible, even if it needs a longer name. And like, like we frequently come back to, if this is a significant molecule in any way, it has a common name or it will shortly. Um, there's a reason that they don't market, you know, Lipitor as, as its IEPAC name. All right, and that's a perfectly good place to end for the day. Because the last thing we had was just amides. And amides don't really do much to react. The only thing that's different about amides is that when you expose them to excess lithium aluminum hydride, you get the amine, not the alcohol. The nitrogen is a worse leaving group than the oxygen, so you wind up making the amine instead. And so we'll start by doing some practice with that and going over that again on Thursday. So we'll end there. And uh, go, go pick out a, a lab and see about See about getting lab ready. Just gonna go uh, grab lunch. No, go go 